very grateful for your presence this morning, your mind being on things spiritual on this holiday season. And we're thankful for those especially that are visiting. We ask that you come back at each and every opportunity that you might have. It's expected in many religious services this morning for the crowds to double, triple, quadruple in size. But you will find that that will be a rare occasion in the churches of Christ. For we understand that worshiping the Lord Jesus and to honor Him is something that we do on a regular basis. And this morning, if you're coming as a friend or a family member, and because of the holiday season, we want you to know that we are open and we welcome you on every Lord's Day. And we're grateful that you have an interest in spiritual things. I want this morning to focus on a question that's on your screen. And it says, what does the Bible say about? This is always a good title. What does the Bible say about anything? And you can place it in the blank. And because of the minds of people, especially in America, this morning, and perhaps all through the world, people want to know about Jesus. They want to know about his birth. They want to know about the baby Jesus. So I would like us to insert that into the equation. What does the Bible say about the birth of Jesus. Now, I'm going to conclude this lesson with an entirely different topic. But to illustrate the importance of going to the Bible, I would like us this morning to spend about half the lesson on this topic. Now, you have before you this morning a little test. I ask that you take that test without opening your Bible. And I would like to know that if you can answer those questions based upon your understanding of the birth of Jesus. The world has a lot to say about the birth of Jesus. Books have been written, movies have been filmed, and people have many traditions surrounding the coming of the Son of God. It is a point of celebration, no doubt. But this morning, I'm not concerned about what all the books say. I'm concerned about the book of books, the Word of God. In fact, the Scriptures want us to avoid confusion by going to the book. In Acts 17 and 11, that the Bereans were more noble than those of Thessalonica because they received the Word of God with all readiness of mind, and they searched the scriptures to see if those things were so. This morning, I want you to search the scriptures. I want you to compare with perhaps your understanding about the birth of Christ. I want you to compare what the world teaches about the birth of Christ with what the Bible actually says. You might be surprised of how many things we just don't know. The scripture says in 2 Timothy 2 and 15, But study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Be diligent. We need to study the scriptures. And we would hope today that people would open their Bibles and they would accept what the Bible says about these topics. The scriptures tell us to prove all things, to hold fast to that which is good, to prove things. We can prove things about the birth of Christ. We can go to the scripture. We can know what is right and what is wrong. It doesn't matter what the topic is regarding the church, the worship, the organization of, the name of, the salvation of Christ, we can know all these things by going to the Scripture, and we can prove it. We can look at what the Bible says. We don't need to rely upon tradition. We don't need to rely upon uh, the popularity of people. We need to rely upon what God has said. In 1 Peter 4 and 11, the Scripture says, If any man speak, let him speak the oracles of God. That's all we seek to do this morning. We seek to speak where God speaks, to be silent where God is silent. And so if that is your aim, if that's your goal this morning, you'll enjoy this lesson. I'm going to begin with just a few questions. I want us to go to the scripture, and every question that we put forth, we're going to give a Bible answer. And so the first question is, how many wise men were there? There are people talk about the wise men. If you've ever been to a, a theatrical um, a performance regarding the birth of Christ, there's always the wise men. And of course, you know, the world commonly puts before us three wise men because after all, uh, that's what the Bible says. Or does it say that? Well, take your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Matthew. Let's notice what the Scripture says. I'm not going to place the Scriptures on the screen. I want you to turn your Bibles. I really want you to open a Bible. So if you've got a pewback Bible, open it up. And let's look at what the Word of God says. Matthew 2 and verse number 7. Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired and then diligently what time the star appeared. Look at verse 11. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, fell down, worshipped him. And when they, that is the wise men, had opened their treasures, they presented to him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so here's what we know from the scripture. We know that the Bible doesn't say 
The Bible doesn't tell us how many wise men there were. The Bible doesn't give the number. But people assume, based upon the three gifts, there were three wise men. Well, friends, that is an assumption that we just don't know. What we do know is that those who studied this uh, particular uh, group of people would report that normally they traveled in caravans and groups, and normally it was more than three. We don't know how many wise men there were, but here is an example of someone who might present a Bible truth, but they have no Bible scripture. We don't know what the answer is. There could have been two, three, four, or 11, or 12. And so it is the case that when it comes to the wise men, the Bible doesn't say. Here's the next question. Did Joseph meet the wise men? Did Joseph actually meet them? And so when the wise men came, did Joseph talk to them? Did he meet them? Did he greet them? Did he see the wise men? Go to Matthew again, chapter 2, verse 11. And we have a Bible answer. And when they were come in to the house, they, that is the wise men, or the magi, more probably a, a more accurate rendering, saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped. Do you know we have no mention in the scripture of the wise men ever seeing the Magi, ever seeing Joseph? But yet when we see these performances and plays, they always see Joseph. Joseph speaks to them. It's as we know what the words were. But in the scripture, we find that we don't even know that Joseph was present when the wise men, uh, the wise men appeared. Let's go to the third question. What animal did Mary ride into Jerusalem or to Bethlehem? Excuse me. Now, Surely we know the answer to this because every performance, every, every play, every book, every picture that we see shows Mary riding the donkey into Bethlehem. So surely the Bible gives us an answer to this. Well, let's go again to Matthew chapter 2 and verse 11. And here it is, uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 2 and verse 5. So take your Bible to Luke's account, the second chapter, and look at the fifth verse. And so to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, with being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Here's the case. Although modern pictures in children's Bible and various other literature show Mary riding a donkey, all the Bible says is that they arrived. They came to the presence of, of Bethlehem. It says nothing about how she got there. Friends, we don't know what she was riding upon. We don't know what kind of animal was there. We really don't know if she walked or rode. We would hope that she rode something. But there were there are many options there could be a donkey a small horse a llama but here's the truth of the matter the bible doesn't tell us we don't know people make assumptions but we just don't know and so you might be uh, this morning considering the fact that there are many things you thought you knew about the birth of christ but you're finding that it's not in the bible i want you to consider are there things you think you know religiously also that are not in the bible because it is the fact that a lot of people think they know these things. They would have, they would have thought to this point, oh, I've scored 100. But yet, perhaps it is the case you've gotten every one of them wrong. Let's notice this next question. The Holy Family named the child Jesus because. Why did the family here name the child Jesus? Well, let's go to Matthew 1 and 21. Notice once again a Bible answer. The Bible says, and they shall bring forth the Son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. And so we understand an angel told Joseph to use the name. That's why. That's why letter B. That's why they named him Jesus. Now that's a Bible answer. We can know that from Scripture. So we can, we can have an inspired understanding of this particular question. Let's go to number five. What type of building was Jesus born in? Was he born in a stable? Well, of course he was, preacher. I've seen it for years. Every Bible picture book, every, every presentation, every drama, every play. Every time you go to a church and they, they, they create something, it's always in some type of stable uh, or cave and in or an inn, preacher. Don't you know the scripture says in or does the Bible not say? Well, dear friends, you might be surprised at this answer. Again, you're in the book of Luke. You're in the second chapter. Again, let's go to verse number seven. And the scripture says this. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Well, see, preacher, it mentions the inn. It's got to be the inn, because the scripture says so. I want you to consider the following when you look a little deeper into this particular text. The Bible does not mention, in fact, any of these places in connection with Christ's birth. It does mention the manger. Scripture simply reports that they laid Jesus in a manger because there was no room for him 
Now, the King James Version uses the word, word in, but you may have a version of the Bible that mentions the word guest room. And let me explain why. The Greek word used in Scripture is kataluma, and means guest chamber. If you defined it strictly, the word for in means a guest chamber, a lodging place, or an inn. The only other time this word is used in the entire Bible is found in Mark 14, 14 through 15, and there it's used and described, translated, the upper story room of a private house. Here's the fact, brothers and sisters, we don't know. We, we really don't know. And yet, but we would thought it was a fact. Oh, he was born out in a, in, in, in a stable somewhere, and, uh, or he was born in an inn somewhere. Because after all, that's what's presented. But when you look at it, biblically speaking, friends, we don't know. We don't have an answer for that. Number six, let's look at another question concerning his birth. What animals were present at the nativity? At the birth of Christ, which is, which is described or called the nativity, what animals were present? Well, of course there were animals present. I mean, they have, you know, they have a, a petting zoo. Some of these particular uh, uh, presentations, I mean, the children can go pet the animals and all the animals that were present. And you know that in every book they have stuffed animals about this preacher, you know that they were there. But in fact, we don't know that they were there. There's no mention of these. And in fact, of course, if you thought it was a stable, you might have made some assumptions, but we don't even know that. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 7, here's what we do know. We know the Bible doesn't say. Once again, people are ascribing things to the Scripture that we just don't know. Friends, we've got to be careful that what tradition says and what people think and opinion polls, these don't become Bible. We've got to check it with the Scripture. Notice this. Who besides the wise men saw the star? Of course, the, you know, we talk about the star. The Scripture talks about it. Go back to Matthew chapter 2. In fact, the Bible says quite a few things about this star that led um, them to Jesus. In Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of, Ju of Judea in the days of Herod, the king beheld, there came wise men, or magi, to the east, to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east, and we're come to worship him. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them, where Christ should be born. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah, and not least among the princesses of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. But when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And so when they saw the star, they rejoiced, and they were exceedingly great or great, uh, glad. And so here's the question. Who besides the wise man saw the star? Well, friends, the Bible doesn't tell us. We don't know. But yet when you see these movies and renditions, I mean, everyone's looking and pointing at it, talking about it. And, there's, and, and the Bible doesn't, doesn't tell us that about the star. Let's look furthermore about this. How does this star compare in brightness with the other stars? Well, of course, if you are again looking at the pictures, you would think it was the brightest thing in the sky. You, you would think it was all kind of like a, a mini sun at night. But once again, we don't know. We don't know uh, how it differed in appearance or if it was the Magi who were maybe um, studying the astrological signs and they noticed a new star, no one perhaps would have noticed. I don't know about you, but I don't study astrology. I don't go out at night and study the star. I wouldn't know if we had a new star or not. But if somebody studied that, they might know. Friends, there's a lot about this we don't know. A lot of assumptions are made. Look at this. How soon after Joseph and Mary reached Bethlehem was Jesus born? Well, of course, we're, we're led to believe that you know, she kind of stumbled into Bethlehem just barely in time, and Jesus was born immediately. Well, is this what the Bible says? Well, let's notice Luke chapter 2, verse 6. Go back to Luke chapter 2, verse 6. Here we're talking about their transition. They're going to Bethlehem. And it was so that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Friends, it appears from the text that, no, Jesus was not born. That, that same day that he arrived. In fact, we don't really know how long they were there. In fact, it would make very little sense 
if we were to assume that, that, that the mother Mary, you know, um, at the very last second just kind of came into Bethlehem to deliver, I mean, it would make no sense. In fact, most mothers, they, they would, if the husband says, let's make a, a journey, a travel, and, and she was about to give birth, would say, no. It's evident here that, that Mary was not expecting to have Jesus immediately. In fact, when they arrived, evidently they waited, we don't know how long, until Jesus was actually born. So in Luke chapter 2 and verse 6, the Bible just doesn't tell us. We, we don't know. Notice this next question. When Mary became pregnant, Mary and Joseph were. Well, what does the Bible say? In Matthew 1 and 18, it says they were espoused. They were engaged. They weren't married. In fact, this is what alarmed Joseph about this, what people might think, because her child was of the Holy Spirit. Let's notice the next one. Who directed Mary and Joseph to go to Bethlehem? Well, who told them to go? Well, let's again go to the Scripture. Luke chapter 2, look at verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there was a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made of Cyrenius, the governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. So Joseph went from Galilee out of Nazareth and Judah, Judea and the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was in, of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. So, so really the only answer we can give to this one is um, that, uh, that Herod had made the, uh, the particular pronouncement that Caesar had made the particular pronouncement. In other words, Caesar is the one that was responsible for the move. Now, he didn't directly tell them, but because they were trying to obey the law, that's why the transition is taking place. That's why they're going to Bethlehem. How many angels spoke to the shepherds? Once again, if you rely upon these plays, you would think the whole host of angels did so. But you'll find in the Bible, that's just not the case. Go to Luke chapter 10, 2 verse 10. The Bible says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. It was one angel who spoke, not a host, and not many, not two, not three, just one. What is a manger anyway? You know, most people, when they think of mangers, think of this, this device right here, this wooden uh, 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 trough type uh, uh, device it has straw in it is this what a manger was for this we just look at you know what is a manger today you go there today can you even see a manger and yes there are still mangers there but what is it what was it during Bible times well the best of our understanding a manger was a feeding trough interesting enough most mangers in New Testament times were made of stone not wood if you visited Israel today, you can see a stone manger used by Solomon to feed his horses at Megiddo. And so even the very manger itself has been perverted, and people don't know. Let's go to number 14. We have two more questions. Then I'm going to bring to your attention why this lesson, I believe, is important. What did the innkeeper say to Mary and Joseph? Well, let's again go to Scripture. Go to Luke chapter 2 and verse number 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Friends, the innkeeper didn't say anything. We don't have any record of the innkeeper saying a word to Mary and Joseph. The Bible doesn't even mention the innkeeper. And yet it is once again assumed that there was an innkeeper and he told them something. Let's go to this last question. Was Jesus born tomorrow on December 25th or in December at all? Look at chapter 2, verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, was Jesus born on Christmas Day because it's called Christmas? Friends, absolutely not. Do you know what we know? Here's what we can take from that scripture. That whatever time period it was, it was not a cold time period. The flocks were out in the field and the shepherds stayed there at night. This did not happen in the wintertime. This had not happened in the cold months. The shepherds would not have been outside. The flock would not have been. They'd have had it in a different location. What we can know from Scripture is that it was not December. Now, many um, Bible scholars have tried to pinpoint the date. I'm not a Bible scholar in that sense. Many of them have come up with dates in September, and it may very well be. But one thing I do know, it was not in the wintertime. Now, friends, why is all this important? Let's bring this home this morning. 
I taught this lesson because I know in the minds of a lot of people is baby Jesus. And they think they know a lot about baby Jesus. While in fact they know very little. The fact is the scripture tells us very little about Christ. And isn't it amazing how many misconceptions, how many facts people believe that aren't facts at all. In fact, some of them are not even true. They're just false and contradicted by scripture. And with such a basic doctrine, a basic teaching about the birth of Christ. If people can get that wrong, here's my question. What else are we getting wrong? What other assumptions are people making that are not true? How many times will people sit in a pew year after year and come to believe something, but they've never once read it in this book? Friends, if it's not in the book, it's not going to be what God wants. Everything God wants us to do is in this book. Now, with that being said, I'm going to just make one point. And I want you to think about it clearly. I want you to go to Acts 22, 16. Let's notice something that is said in Acts 22, 16. And before you read it, I want you to pick your option. Which one of these do you know? You say, well, preacher, I've heard, I've been in churches for years. I know that option one is right because the preacher has said it for a long time. Most people believe option one, and you're right, most people do. I've been giving this little questionnaire for 20 years. I can tell you that 98 people out of every 100 pick option one. In fact, I know that. I can show you the numbers. Because option one is what they've been taught. Option one is what's, what's commonly believed. Most people believe you call on the name of the Lord. You have some type of prayer. You come and say a, a prayer. You have a testimonial or something like that. Your sins are forgiven. You're saved. And then later, maybe... Later that day, maybe next week, next month, maybe next year, maybe years from that point, you're baptized. Friends, that's what's commonly believed among people. If you were to take a poll, just about every denominational person would say, that's, that's Bible. But yet you say, where is it in the Bible? And they, they can't show you. You can't find a Bible passage anywhere that teaches that. Now let's look at option two. Option two says you're baptized, your sins are washed away, you're saved, and you, that's how you call on the name of the Lord. Now, friends, here's what's ironic. If you look at Acts 22, 16, and let's look at Acts 22 very quickly, verse 16. And why tarriest thou, why tarriest you? Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, I want you to look at that passage carefully. I want you to look at the order of events. Ladies, if you were given a recipe, perhaps today you're going to do some cooking. And in the recipe, there's an order of things that you've got to do. For example, perhaps the first thing you do is mix the flour, the sugar, and the egg, and, and, and a sundry other ingredients. Maybe the last thing you need to do is put it in the oven. Well, let's just decide you, you said this. You know, the order is not important. It doesn't matter what order you do it as long as you do it. So you decide before mixing just to put it in the oven. And you'd make the oven the, the first thing you do. Well, you know exactly what's going to happen. You're not going to have a meal. You're not going to have a dessert. It's not going to work. The order matters. You've got to do what God says in the order God says it. You've got to believe what the Bible says and stop believing what everybody else says. Did you notice here in Acts 22, 16, what happened? If you go back to this particular chart, you're going to notice option number one is the reversal of Acts 22, 16. Here's my question this morning. Does it matter that we get this right? Does it matter that we follow what God says in the way God says it? Or can we do what God says, but we'll do it in the way we want to do it? We'll do it on my time period. I'll do it when I feel it's right. I'll do it when the pastor tells me. I'll do it when the preacher tells me. I'll do it however, whatever people want me to do. Or does it matter that we do it in the way God says? Friends, you look at Acts 22, 16, and you look at this chart, and anyone who can read knows the difference. Anyone who can read knows which one Acts 22, 16 teaches. Now, here's the question this morning. Which one did you do? If you did option number one, you didn't follow this verse. You didn't do what God says in the way God says it. You didn't do what the Bible says. So the question is, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to go through the rest of your life? trying to justify and come up with answers and reasons why you didn't do it this way? Or will you come this morning and will you say, you know what? I know if I do what God says and the way God says it, I know I'm going to heaven. 
There's no question about it. No more doubts. This morning, dear friends, here's the question that's really important. It's not the nativity. It's not about the birth of Jesus. It's about what are you going to do with what Jesus did for you? He died on the cross for you. Are you willing to be baptized, to wash away your sins by the blood of Christ? Are you willing to be saved the Bible way? Are you willing to call on the name of the Lord the way Jesus says? Are you willing to come and do what the Bible says? If we can help you do that this morning, please, would there, would there be a better time? I can't think of a better group of people to do it in front of. Make a commitment to God and say, God, I'm tired of arguing. I'm tired of making excuses. I'll just do exactly what this book says because then there's no doubt whatsoever. Will you do that? As together we stand and as we sing.